Hello, everybody. Happy July 4th weekend. I'm glad that you were able to join us for this special update on recent developments and hot topics. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to say, but I'll be saying it, whatever it is. I have a special guest today, my friend Sandy Glazier, who is a tax and trust lawyer from Michigan. And people in Michigan are smarter than people in Florida. On average, I have found so we invited her and she will definitely prove that up. I welcome questions, comments, and suggestions. I will be checking my emails at agasman at gasmanpa.com uh, throughout this presentation and I'll answer whatever questions I can. If I don't know the answer to your question, then I'll just make an answer up. That worked in law school and it'll probably work as well here. Please keep in mind that one hour or so after the presentation, we will post the video to YouTube and you can go to YouTube and watch anything you want, including the video, all for free, fun, 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 and tell all of your friends about it. Or in particular, if you don't like the presentation, tell your enemies about it. This presentation does not qualify for continuing education credit. And if you tell the accreditation authorities that you watched this a webinar, then they may take other credit away from you. So probably keep it quiet that you're participating in this webinar. By the way, one hot topic for me is that the Florida Supreme Court, on their own volition, about two weeks ago, declared that I cannot get continuing education credit for American Bar Association uh, events that occur after June 1st because the American Bar Association requires diversity speakers. If you give an American Bar Association full day talk, you have to have at least one diversity speaker. The Florida Bar felt that that was illegal under a US Supreme Court case. So of course they've never complained about continuing education programs with Russia and Cuba, but continuing education programs with the ABA, that doesn't cut it with our Florida Supreme Court. Go figure. Uh, please, Tell, spread the word and sign up for our Saturday program. I hope you're enjoying it. If you're awake, if you're listening, if not, if you're not enjoying it, maybe have a drink, a Bloody Mary might be a good idea, or a mimosa. But anyway, next week we're going to cover more mathematics of, a, of estate tax planning. It'll probably be much more of the same, but you probably won't remember that we're repeating ourselves over and over and over again. So there's our YouTube uh, videos. July 9th, a not so free presentation. I'll be speaking for 90 minutes for Limeberg Information Services on the new Florida Community Property Trust Law. This becomes effective July 1st and enables anyone from anyone in the anywhere in the country to form a trust in Florida. All you need is a Florida trustee, and everybody has a cousin in Miami. We know that from the Jimmy Buffett song. And then your trustee can hold your trust assets. And when one spouse dies, voila, a complete full step up in income tax basis. Does that sound too good to be true? That spouse one dies and spouse two, so sad, is able to sell the assets and pay no capital gains tax? Well, that is certainly the position of the state of Florida, the state of Alaska, the state of South Dakota and the state of Tennessee, four states that have these community property trust laws. Florida and Tennessee allow creditors of either spouse to reach up to half of the assets in this community property trust. Alaska and South Dakota allow the a creditor to reach all of the assets of the community property trust. Not such a good thing. If you live in a community property state, such as California and Texas and Wisconsin, then you don't need a community property trust. But please keep in mind that if one spouse is sued, you lose all community property assets. Not a good thing. So even if you're in California and you want the benefits of, Cal of, of California community property, on the first death, maybe you should change to a Florida community property trust where you only lose half of the assets if one of you is sued. So that is one recent development. I'll be uh, finalizing an article soon that has over 20 Jimmy Buffett quotations in it, celebrating the state of Florida 
in our new community property trust law. Uh, please join us next Saturday at 1 p.m. if you're a real glutton on what you need to know about the sale of a distressed business entity. If you would like to buy a distressed business entity out of bankruptcy, this is your lesson plan. Or if you're a lawyer or accountant who represents distressed entities, I don't mean high anxiety, I mean not enough money to pay the bills and it may crash and burn. Or if you're doing well, charitable planning for the business owner, lots of neat things you can do. Uh, we've been doing some of those neat things and we'll talk about that for St. Petersburg College in particular, Wednesday, July 31st. Click here to, to subscribe to our Thursday report, a free newsletter uh, that comes out almost every Thursday. If you want to ask a question, and thanks for doing that, you can go ahead and click on questions there on the bar, and then you can ask the question, and then I'll pretend not to see it if I don't know the answer. Okay, here's one question, and we welcome questions. If you send questions during the week, we might make them into a slide. I read my life insurance trust. Well, that's pretty cool. Not every client reads their trust. I remember back in 1987, a client read his trust. He's never been the same since. Anyway, this trust says, open quotes, that the trustee can lend money upon terms and conditions that the trustee deems in the best interest of the estates and the beneficiary, including from one trust to another, and to borrow on behalf of one trust from another, and including the right to lend money to the trustor, that's the same thing as the settlor, if so requested by the trustor. Any loan will be adequately secured. I, I don't like the clause. Um, the part about if so requested by the trustor, that makes it mandatory that the trustee would have to lend money to the grantor. I don't think that that necessarily would cause a problem, but it is unusual and I'm, uh, I'm glad you spotted it. And if your attorney has support for the proposition that you could put in a life insurance trust that the trustee must loan money to the grantor upon request, I would love to see support for that. And next week I could eat my hat if I'm wrong. Now, this is an aspirational period of time. We are in the July 4th weekend. You should be with your family and not listening to me. But in any event, maybe you'll have time to do some things that you should have done. Now, I love Peter Drucker, uh, a wonderful business professor that said, if you want to do something great, you have to stop doing something else. So whatever your biggest time waster is, whoever that is, assuming that it's not your spouse, let's eliminate that biggest time waster Call your liability and casualty insurance carriers on Tuesday, send them an email, your agency, make sure you have sufficient coverages. Make sure you understand your coverages. Use the 4% rule that we've talked about before and make sure that you have enough liquidity that if you die, your family will not have to cry at the funeral because of lack of liquidity. You want them to cry because of lack of you, not lack of liquidity. Number nine, if you can afford it, get to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester or in Jacksonville and get yourself a full day physical. They will resolve things that you may not have resolved and then you can be a patient of record at Mayo. And if you have an issue, you're much more likely to be getting to be able to get in there. So a full day physical, not half an hour, uh, a full day. You'll meet with specialists. You'll meet with your primary care doctor in the morning. They'll give you all kinds of tests. And in the late afternoon, you'll meet with two or three doctors to discuss your situation. So that's a great investment in your health. We want you to live a long time so that you don't have to test how our estate plan went. But speaking of the estate plan, please get that in order. Please don't delay. And also, how about the estate plan for your parents, the estate plan for your children? Number five, make your marriage really, really good. Not like it is now, really, really good. And number 16, most important, the biggest challenge that most parents have, make your children self-supporting. Make them be your friends 
and not your dependents as soon as possible. Maybe not before age 12 or 14, but certainly by age 24, they need to be completely independent. So let them know that that's the goal. Now, we have a lot of things to uh, talk about today as far as hot topics and uh, techniques. Some of them are pictured here. Anyone who's wealthy should really know all of these items, should consider all of these items on pages 17 and 18. Take these to your estate planner. She probably will never forgive me, but go through these items and make sure that you have thought about how they may work for you including number 17, spend it all instead. See a psychologist to give you permission to just spend it in case you uh, don't need it. Now, this just came to me this morning by email. Thank you very much to the Florida Osteopathic Medical Association. We have a new Parents' Bill of Rights, which makes it a first-degree misdemeanor for a pediatrician to treat a minor child without consent of the parent or guardian. So get your child care power of attorney put together. When you go out of town, your child will not be able to be treated except in the emergency room under an emergency. This is not a great law in my estimation, and probably a pediatrician who breaks this law is going to risk loss of her medical license. So just the type of stuff that happens and the importance of having powers of attorney in place while you're living. We are presently uh, representing a very, very nice family. And the grandmother has had a, a, maybe a mini stroke. We're not sure, but she cannot make decisions. The agent under her power of attorney is her longtime lawyer who we can't find. He retired six years ago and we can't find him. He's not answering the phone. Nobody's at his address. And he's the agent under the power of attorney. So now we have to hire a detective to write a report to confirm that he's not able or willing to serve because we can't find him. So if you happen to know him, his name is Bernard and his last name begins with an L. He's a lawyer in Clearwater. If you happen to know Bernard, please have him call me or send me an email. It is very important. Okay. Our guest speaker today, I am so tired of hearing myself, I thought I would like to get tired of hearing somebody else. Sandy Glazer, a very, very brilliant, dedicated lawyer in Michigan who specializes not only in estate planning and estate tax planning, but also in trust litigation. And she also specializes in being a great, great person. But anyway, uh, Sandy did a great job and we messed it up with some technical issues. So we're gonna send you uh, Sandy's video and we're gonna send you, and, and you have her slides here. Um, it is quite disconcerting that the Von Holland proposal has some support in Congress to impose a capital gains on death. That would not be such a good thing and to impose a capital gains tax on assets and trust every 21 years like they do in Canada. If you put assets in an irrevocable trust and you are a Canadian, then you will be then that trust will be considered to have sold its assets at fair market value every 21 years or if it's owned by an individual, it's considered to be sold when the individual dies or when the individual transfers the asset. So um, not such a good thing, pretty, pretty frustrating for those of us who are the planners here. And the question becomes, if I make a transfer now, today, to an irrevocable trust, is there any chance that that transfer is gonna cause a tax because it's a, to a trust that is disregarded for income tax purposes? I personally don't think that there's a chance in heck that any type of punitive estate tax legislation is gonna come down the pike this year or affect this year. For one thing, there's not enough votes on the Democratic side to have that happen. And for another thing, if it happened retroactively and people got seriously hurt, I think it would be a big problem. 
On the other hand, even Joe Manchin is saying that he would not mind seeing a 28% capital gains tax rate or a 25% corporate income tax rate. And I could see that being retroactive, at least back to when these things are, are uh, proposed. Typically, and almost 90% of the time, the effective date of new tax legislation is the day that the specific law is proposed formally by the House Ways and Means Committee. If you haven't read the Constitution of the United States lately, then you might not remember that all laws start with the House Ways and Means Committee, in the tax world at least. So then they get approved by the House, then the Senate, then signed by the President. And I don't think we're anywhere near uh, that situation. But certainly they are targeting the top one tenth of 1%. They need tax money and they're gearing the public to treat, to view the top tenth of 1% as accessible. In fact, one a Senator, and by the way, I wanted to plug the nitty gritty tax report. Tony Nitty, who is a really, really good and smart CPA and writer, spends about 80% of his time writing for a, a national tax publisher and also his amazing Forbes blog. So I am a subscriber and I always read Tony's uh, weekly report and you can also. But Senator Wyden in his report proposed that if you make more than a million dollars a year and you have more than $10 million of assets, then you will pay a tax every year on a percentage of your asset growth. So if on December 31st of a particular year, you're worth 20 million, and then December 31st of the next year, you're worth 25 million, then they will multiply that $5 million by some percentage, however small, it will still be significant, and impose a tax. I think you know that a couple of South American company, countries have recently simply said, if you're worth more than X dollars, send us 3% of what you're worth. We need to balance our budget this month. So that uh, certainly could happen. There, there would be a constitutional challenge under the Isner v. McComer case. But the question is, will they count wealth that was put into an irrevocable trust and is not considered as owned by the individual at the time that the tax is imposed? And I would guess that the answer will be no, because they'll still want to, pl want to please, to some extent, their big donors. So to me, it's even more compelling and more likely that clients who are on the fence and should have done an installment sale or a transfer to an irrevocable trust should do the installment sale or the transfer. The other thing in Tony's report uh, this week is that we have a new ruling for all you CPAs and tax lawyers will wanna look at this ruling uh, under section 1202. Now, a Section 1202 company is a C corporation taxed at its own brackets, owned by an individual or a trust, and on the sale of that company stock, there is no tax whatsoever. So I could establish a C corporation, have it engage in an active business, have it taxed at the corporate bracket, and then I could sell the stock and pay no income tax on the sale of stock. Well, 1202 companies are not allowed when it is a personal professional venture, but we've had very little guidance from the IRS on what a personal professional venture is. This new ruling, which, which you um, have here, 2021-25004, just released June 25th, I think is only the third or fourth indication we have about 1202 from the Internal Revenue Service, and it allowed what appears to be 
either a pharmacy or an orthotics operation or something similar where they customize a patient's medical prescription to provide what the patient needs. And this will qualify as a 1202 company. So the investors can invest in this company. And if they hold their investment, the prerequisite number of years, and then they sell their stock, no capital gains tax whatsoever under the 1202 rules. Now, what we've done for some clients is we have set up management companies that are engaged in the active management of the client's business in a C corporation. And then that C corporation, in order to qualify under 1202, has to invest in active business assets. So in one situation, the client pays a management fee, the company's managed by his children, and then the company buys billboards and leases them out. So it's in the billboard business. And eventually, when a big player in the billboard business wants to buy that company, the client will sell that company and pay zero capital gains tax under the present law. Now, another recent development is that the IRS released its dirty dozen list on its website in a way that you can't figure out what the, the list is. You can only see five of the items in their announcement and three of the items when you click here and there. So the IRS's dirty dozen list, if you know the person who runs the IRS dirty dozen list, do me a favor and call them and ask them to fix it so that we know what the dirty dozen items are. But it's more creditor protection by the IRS, thank you, than it is tax abuse. There are people out there misleading taxpayers, showing them how to file things in ways that hurt them and help the person who uh, files it. Now, we do have news here that the IRS is making IPINs available to all taxpayers so that we can now have our own unique IRS PIN number. So um, that's good to know. What I was able to derive though here on page 58, there's fake charities out there. So you have to be aware when you give money to a charity, make sure it's a real one. There's a lot of fraud on seniors and immigrants. So seniors need to be very careful. I think everyone knows that people from outside of the United States are calling senior citizens, telling them that they're the IRS, telling them they owe $800, getting their credit card number. It's really a horrific situation. Unscrupulous tax return preparers. A lot of my clients have told me over the years, oh, I got a new CPA. Uh, just moved into town, really smart, used to work for the IRS, and knows some really, really unique techniques that no one else knows that they learned when they were in the IRS. Well, the IRS does not teach tax fraud. So it's almost a red flag for me when I hear that somebody has a tax return preparer who used to work for the IRS. Be careful when you have a tax return preparer who does the wink and says, you can get away with this, you can get away with that. It's not really legal, but everyone does it. That's not good. Because when the IRS sits that tax return preparer down and tells them about their jail sentence, they'll get a lighter jail sentence for turning you in. So be careful there. So uh, the other one, they're going after the micro captives. What is a micro captive? A micro captive is a insurance company that I could set up to insure the risks of my law firm. And I could set it up in the Cayman Islands or Bermuda or another jurisdiction. And I pay an insurance premium to this micro captive company. I'm on the cash method of accounting. I write off the insurance premium as an expense. The micro captive is on the accrual method of accounting and it reserves expenses. And so it doesn't pay any tax. Now, if it's the real deal, then I'm gonna to have to pay $100,000 or more to an actuary to design the plan. And then my micro captive is going to get reinsurance from a reinsurance carrier. They're almost all in London, England. So at least I get to write off my trip to London to talk to Lloyd's of London and the others. 
So instead of me paying $600,000 a year for a traditional insurance policy, I'm paying my micro captive $400,000 a year. My micro captive is paying Lloyd's of London $150,000 a year. And that may work. That may work. But there's many micro captives that aren't doing anything but evading taxes or are doing this in a very loose way. If you've been in one of these micro captives, make sure you talk to a reputable advisor. It needs to be a lawyer, not a certified public accountant. It needs to be a lawyer under the lawyer client privilege to review what you have done with this captive because the CPA client privilege does not apply if fraud is involved and the IRS will almost certainly assert fraud if you're in a micro captive. With the Trump indictment happening, there's gonna be a lot more awareness of criminal tax laws. And please be aware that if you've done something aggressive and you amend the return and basically fess up, you don't have to call the IRS, you just amend the return and pay the tax, disclose what happened, then they will not criminally prosecute you if they are not already in an audit or in an investigation. And there's a lot of people out there who might want to uh, do that. I do have later the fraud, the Trump indictment, and I'm not reviewing this for any political reason. I'm reviewing it to show you uh, what this accountant apparently did. He was the head accountant for the Trump organization. And he did things that maybe he thought were cute, or maybe he thought it was his patriotic duty to avoid these taxes. But instead, he got arrested, handcuffed, and is looking at at least some jail time. Now, according to the indictment papers, the Trump organization did what's generally good planning. They set up a company called Trump Payroll Corp. And I like the idea of a payroll company hiring the employees for five or six businesses, because then when an employee gets in a car accident working for one of the businesses, the other four don't get sued. They only sue the business that the company that the employee was driving for, and also the payroll company, which has uh, no assets other than the payroll money that runs through it. But this gentleman had an annual compensation amount that he was supposed to be receiving from this company. And what he would do is he took a salary and then he would reduce his bonuses at the end of the year by whatever benefits he received. And we call that side sheeting. And it's legal to side sheet if the expenses you receive are deductible. I mean, if you decide that you need to go to Las Vegas for a five-day convention and you stay in Las Vegas for six days, your spouse comes with you and helps you wine and dine, your meals are all with other people who you're whining and dining, and then at the end of the year, your bonus is reduced by that or by a percentage of that, that's okay. But in this situation, according to the allegations, they were paying the rent on an apartment where he lived full-time in New York City. He never told the city of New York that he lived there, so he wasn't paying New York City taxes, and he never declared the rent that was being paid or the utilities or the other items as income, and the company probably wrote these items off. We don't know for sure. And then, Apparently, according to the indictment, Donald Trump himself signed checks to put this man's descendants through college. Now, I don't know whether Donald Trump considered that to be a gift, which would not have to be reported because payment of tuition is a gift that doesn't have to be reported. But according to the allegations, they reduced this man's bonuses by the amounts that were paid by Donald Trump to put his, his uh, children or grandchildren, whoever they were, through college. He also had a Mercedes lease. Now, this is very common. 
a lot of clients get a car and they ride it and they, they declare it to be 90% business when it's really not 90% business. In this case, his wife had a car and there's no reference to his wife doing anything for the Trump uh, organization. And then he did something else. He wrote checks to employees who cashed them and he got the cash back for holiday expenses and apparently there were no receipts for the expenses. So these types of things, um, I will say a lot of clients come in and think that they're cute or they think that they're neat. And I think that they are a huge exposure. And I, at least as a tax lawyer, do not do these things in my business. And I quite honestly hope that you don't do these things in your business, because if you do, then you're setting a trap for your soon-to-be ex-spouse or your ex-daughter or son-in-law or your ex-comptroller to go report you to the IRS as a whistleblower and to make some, some nice, nice, nice money at your expense while you defend a criminal action. So not a nice thing. Here, is, uh, here are some transactions that, that we've been working on and that, that we've been uh, explaining to clients. Here's a client who in 2020 did an installment sale and is owed a $10 million note by a dynasty trust that has a $1,100,000 in it. And the transaction's going well. And now he would like to do a second installment sale. So we said, okay, well, let's set up 2021 LLC and put $15 million worth of assets in there, sell the 99% non-voting member interest to the Dynasty Trust for another $10 million note. But he said, wait a minute, if one of these assets crashes and burns, then I haven't gotten anything out of my estate because I, I'm because then the note that the 20 million that I'm owed will carry everything back out. So we said, okay, well, let's set up a second dynasty trust and do a second sale. And he said, I don't want to do a second dynasty trust because I don't want to do another seed capital gift. And I don't want to pay you to do another trust. And I don't want to pay a trust company to manage two trusts. So uh, we did some brainstorming and came up with this structure. Step one, the dynasty trust, which has a million one hundred thousand puts a million into a subsidiary LLC that's disregarded for income tax purposes. And then the client puts the 15 million of new investments into a new 2021 LLC. You see there on the left. And then the client sells the 99% interest in the new 2021 LLC to the new Dynasty Trust subsidiary LLC in exchange for a note. So now, if the new LLC dynasty, I mean, if the new 2021 LLC crashes and burns, the client will have to write off the $10 million note, but at least will still be owed the 10 million note and still have the positive worth of the 2020 LLC. Hard to explain, but you could probably figure it out. Um, here's a client who wants to keep control over everything, so he'll be the manager of these LLCs, puts two million four of investments in LLC1, sells a 99% non-voting member interest in LLC1 to a dynasty trust after making a $160,000 seed capital gift, gets back a $1,600,000 note, interest at 2% a year, that gives them 32,000 a year. There's enough money in LLC2 to make those payments for five years. After that, the LLC1 will have to start making distributions. The tr Dynasty Trust is disregarded for income tax purposes. And this quite candidly is what we are uh, doing the most of. 10 years later, the assets are worth 4 million eight, and he still only owed a million six hundred thousand dollar note that assumes approximately an eight percent rate of interest. A hot topic because people are starting to use it 
us included, is the Section 678 GST Trust exemption under private letter ruling 2016 33021. Yes, it took me a minute to say that. What the heck is it? Well, client comes in with a problem. The problem is a non GST exempt trust. It's irrevocable. It's out of the client's estate, but they did not have the foresight or the knowledge when they drafted it to have an estate, to have it save estate tax at the level of the child. So when the children die, this trust is going to be subject to federal estate tax. It has $20 million worth of assets. So what somebody did in this private letter ruling is they said, we will have trust one form trust two, or we will have the client form trust two. And we will get, trust two will be a GST exempt trust. So trust one transfers a, a million four to trust number two, or the grantor transfers a million four to trust number two. And trust number two is a irrevocable trust. It's separately taxed. And trust number one, has the right to withdraw income from trust number two. So I made a mistake. Trust number two is not independently separately taxed. Because trust one has the right to withdraw the income from trust two, all of the income and deductions of trust two are going to go on to the income tax return of trust one because of Internal Revenue Code section 678. Now, trust two invests in very low or no dividend stocks. So it's going to grow without having to give any income to trust one. It grows tax exempt. Or trust two invests in assets that have a lot of income. Trust one will pay the income tax on that income. So trust two will get bigger and stay GST exempt. And trust one will get smaller and not be GST exempt. So at the end of the day, trust one is getting smaller, trust two is getting bigger. How do we speed that up? Trust one puts 20 million worth of assets into an LLC in exchange for voting and non-voting member interests. And trust one sells a 99% non-voting member interest to trust two for a $14 million promissory note. So now trust one has a real value of 14 million and a growth rate of 2% at most. And trust two now has a value of at least 6 million and a growth rate that will be whatever its growth is minus the interest it owes on the note. So after 20 years, if you get a rate of return of approximately 8%, trust one is worth 11 million and trust two is worth 80 million. So you can divert the growth in a non-GST trust to a GST trust. And this can work with uh, life insurance as well. Another planning idea, and I think these are hot topics because these are things that people are doing and should be doing. This client has $3 million of investments and then stock in a closely held company that's worth somewhere between 50,000 and a million and may become worth 50 million if certain things align, if the stars align and the, and the long shot happens. So, LLC one initially owns LLC two. We sell the 99% non-voting member interest in LLC one to an irrevocable complete gift trust in exchange for a $2 million note. And then, the, the, and before that, the client sells a 44% non-voting member interest in complete 
in to the in the uh, LLC that holds the high probability of the stock in exchange for a fifty thousand dollar note. So there's a total of two million fifty thousand owed by the complete gift trust to the client, and the complete gift trust owns ninety nine percent of LLC one and forty four percent of LLC two. Then the client reduces the note from twenty from two million fifty thousand to six hundred thousand. He's made a million four hundred and fifty thousand dollar gift that is reported on the gift tax return. The client in our situation does not want to disclose all the details of the arrangement to the IRS on a gift tax return. He'll let his grandchildren worry about that someday or his great grandchildren. He's just going to show a million four fifty reduction of note. If the IRS audits it, he'll have to explain everything and value everything more formally. If not, he won't. We, of course, have recommended that he for, that he do everything formally and that he spend a lot of money on a valuation report. He's elected not to do that for the time being. Then for creditor protection, he transfers his note and 20% of his non-voting LLC2 interest to an incomplete gift trust. He could put in more, but he doesn't need to. Now, when LLC2 explodes in value to 50 million, you're going to have 44% of 50 million going into the, to the complete gift trust. That's 21 million. You're going to have 20% of 50 million, that's 10 million, go to the incomplete gift trust. And you're going to have 35% of 50 million go to the client, which he will use to pay his income taxes, unless he elects to have a charitable remainder trust put into place before the uh, transaction. So the design of these types of arrangements, the ability to use only two trusts when you would have had four or six, um, can be significant and very advantageous. Very, very advantageous. Okay, I've got slides here for the Community Property Trust. The Florida Community Property Trust will cause some publicity and more of the uh, your clients or your friends to consider establishing an irrevocable trust that can own ass. I mean, a revocable trust that can own assets of a married couple. When the one spouse dies, there's a full step up of all of the assets. The IRS has not blessed this, but they have not directly criticized it either. We're going to wait and see what they think. But while you're at it, you can consider what we call a just trust, where you would, I think, have a better chance of getting a full step up on the first death, and you can lock up all of the assets on the first death. So more to talk about on that. The Qualified Personal Residence Trust is also a very hot topic, and quite honestly, most of us got out of hab the habit of using them because houses were not going up in value that fast, and clients had a lot of other assets that they could use to do gifting. But now we're in a situation where if something like the Biden plan passes, we have to do everything we can with everything we have. So the Qualified Personal Residence Trust allows the client with an $860,000 home, the client is 68 years old, we give half of the home to a trust for each spouse. If it is a 12-year cupid, only 46.916% of the home is considered to be a gift. Yet if the client lives past 12 years, the entire home is out of her estate for estate tax purposes. So it's definitely something worth considering. Next week, we'll go through the math on this. We'll go through our calculator. I'll send the attendees our updated Cupert calculator so that you can uh, run the numbers on your own. Another thing you can do in the homestead world is put your home into an irrevocable trust for the child if the child lives there. That can be a 678 trust where the income tax on the sale of the home is taxable to the child who lived there. 
but not taxable to the extent to of $250,000 because of the one-time exclusion under Internal Revenue Code Section 121, even though the home is really going to be used later as a retirement vehicle for the spouse, as a spousal limited access trust. So that would be a Section 678 spousal limited access trust. If you think about that, you might find that it is uh, quite a good arrangement. The hottest thing, but we've discussed it, and you can go back in, to the YouTube and see our SLAT talk, is the spousal limited access trust, where one spouse puts assets into a trust for the health, education, and maintenance of the other spouse. So let me see now if I've received any email questions that we can answer. The first question is, is there an echo? Is there an echo? Is there an echo? Is there an echo? And yes, I apologize. There was an echo. And it wasn't just me saying the same thing over and over again. It was a technical difficulty, but we will send you that video so that uh, you can watch it. The captive insurance uh, discussion, uh, Michaelina, was my thoughts, not Sandy's. Uh, but if you disagree, you can go ahead and criticize uh, Sandy's. Okay, Dale says to Alan, what do you think is going to happen on the tax end of things? Well, I think that this year, the taxes are going to go up to what they were before Donald Trump was elected for people who make more than $400,000 a year. So I think we're going to get a 39.6% individual tax rate. And in addition to that, I think the capital gains rate may go as high as 28%, which is what we had under Ronald Reagan. Remember, Reagan took away the loopholes. Uh, and then he, he flattened the uh, the tax rate. So that that's worst case scenario. On the estate tax situation, I think worst case scenario is that they will accelerate the reduction of the estate tax exemption from 11 million seven to one half of that amount beginning next year, instead of waiting for that to happen January 1, 2026. I do not think that we will have a wealth tax because it's pretty foreign from what everybody's used to. And the wealthiest people are the biggest donors to political campaigns. And I do not uh, think that we will have a capital gains tax on death. For one thing, it would be very hard to administer. Uh, it's a, there's a chance that that would happen. Um, it might be advantageous to die before you're in to get the step up but probably not worthwhile for most of you. Maybe your families think otherwise, but probably not most of you. Okay, here's a question from Claire. In Florida, we used to have an intangible personal property tax. That's right, it was two tenths of 1% of the value of your stocks. Okay, this this, the, will there be a federal tax like that? Well, I guess there could be. Which, if any, tax rates can be changed through reconciliation versus starting in the Ways and Means Committee? Sorry, I have no idea. Um, can you talk more about slats? I can talk more about slats, but our, our time is up here. I do, again, apologize for the uh, technical issues. We will uh, try to rehearse better next time to make it less likely that we'll have technical issues. I'll come back next week. I'll finish some of these slides that I didn't finish. Please send me your questions, comments, and suggestions. And I do very much appreciate the opportunity to present here. Have a fantastic weekend with your family. And here's one last book, Build a Business, Not a Job by David Finkel, Stephanie Harkness, a really, really practical book for business owners and professionals to think about what you can stop doing and let other people do for you.
I believe the book is free on the internet if you find it. Otherwise, let me know. I'll be glad to mail you a copy. David sends me as many as I like. Have a great, great 4th of July. And remember to get along great with your spouse, whether your spouse agrees with that or not, and make your children self-supporting. Thank you very much.